Hello, Matthew. Hello, Michaela. When you die, what cocktail do you want people to remember you by? I don't drink cocktails often, so I'm going to go with a good classic rum and punch. That's not really a cocktail, but... You said jungle juice. Thank I mean... Thank you. <laughs> you know that you're going to have a good time no matter what. <laughs> so, Matt, today we're going to be taking a little trip down to the John S. McMillan Memorial Mausoleum. Try saying that five times fast. I refuse. So, um, have you ever been to the mausoleum? Have you seen the site? I have seen the site when I was actually in San Juan County for other business, but I I did see it because it's a very popular tourist spot. So what do you know about this mausoleum, Matthew? What were you told when you saw this, I don't know what to call it, this great structure? <laughs> I mean, it just seemed like it was a uh, a monument in San Juan County built by some rich guy. Well, what if I told you you were correct and also <laughs> <laughs> that it's um, a lot weirder than it might seem, even though it seems pretty weird. Mm, that's not a good sign considering the design of that area. Okay. Well. <laughs> that has me with a moment of pause thinking, how weird can this get? <laughs> So, I am going to be telling you the history of this mausoleum. So, also known as the Afterglow Vista, the John S. McMillan Memorial Mausoleum is located in the San Juans, as you said. It's a 20-minute drive from Friday Harbor near Roche Harbor. Mm -hmm. And according to the Tucker House Inn, which sells itself based on the fact that it's close to this mausoleum and um, it's a draw point, it's his history. It says that the name Afterglow Vista was given because, quote, the phenomenal play of colors in the channel's waters during Roche summer sunsets, end quote. See, I never got to experience it during the summer. I, I was there in the spring, so I must have missed that part so, of the travel brochure. <laughs> I think we should go stay in this inn and then spend overnight at the afterglow and see the sunset. And I think it will not be a haunted time at all. Oh, no. I don't like where this is heading already. Okay. <laughs> I'm rethinking the whole maybe we should go by. It's not that far away. <laughs> Um, according to Atlas Obscura, said, quote, this family mausoleum is steeped in symbolism and looks more like a fantasy location than a grave. That's true. It looks like a Final Fantasy level. Straight out of Tolkien. Ah, a little bit more Kojima. <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but I'll take your word for it. Um, So, we'll paint you a picture of what the Afterglow Vista looks like for those like me who have never been able to see it in person. When you reach the Afterglow Vista, you must first walk through a stone gate with a metal arch reading Afterglow Vista. The mausoleum is sitting in the center of the path and is surrounded by evergreen trees. You then walk through a graveyard of old tombstones covered in ivy and surrounded by green old iron. The mausoleum is an open air limestone rotunda with six columns, one of which is broken. Very important. We'll come back to that. At the center of the rotunda is a round limestone table at its center. 
and around the table are six chairs with an inscription of the person it represents on the back. The table and seats are gray and the legs of the chair are a rusted brown color. Inside each of these chairs are hollow niches that hold the family members' ashes. So this is where they're entombed. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm into creepy shit, so I'm like real down with this. <laughs> I mean, the idea of being all buried together, it's, it's a certain appeal to it. In like a mausoleum. It's yeah, pre- I mean. It's pretty metal. Yeah, it gives you the whole like, the whole family's here kind of. It's, it's pretty cool, I guess. But we're going to dive a little bit deeper into um, the McMillan family and maybe... It will seem a little more weird and less cool. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, any, when I when I first said it seemed like a rich guy's thing, I just assumed there's some weird stuff that comes along with that territory. If you're rich, you're weird. It's like a, <laughs> it's just a rule. It's not. There's no normal rich people. It's a law of the universe. <laughs> you don't get that way by being a normal human being. <laughs> So on the back of each of these chairs, these essentially tombs of the family members, um, one reads, A-22 Mason, Knight Templar, Sigma Chi, Methodist, Republican, and then their date of life. So we'll say their name, all of that shit, and then their, when they lived. So sometimes the fraternity also changes so like um fred (laughs) height mcmillan his son's um red sigma alpha epsilon um or the mason rank will change depending um so there was one person who was a noble of the mystic shrine another who was an elk um which if you don't know because i did not refers to the benevolent and protective order of elks which was started as a social club for minstrel show performers. Yeah, that's uh also yeah. called the Jolly Corps. I took I t- I took my AP test in a Elks club when I was in high school. That was an interesting experience uh, finding out what their history was after. Yeah, so Matt, as a black person, how do you feel about minstrel shows? I'm sure you love them, right? I mean, they're the basis of a base eighty percent of American comedy, so it's kind of an awkward part of American history. But also, we we really don't like them. We actually don't like them at all, especially when the shoe polish comes out. <laughs> I think that um, this guy would be very chill with knowing that you would visit his um, gravestone. And potentially sit on his grave. I, I mean, did not do that. I, 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 <laughs> now the thought has crossed my mind that I should have. We could. But we could still make it happen. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to have a, a thriller situation. <laughs> the only <clears throat> exception um, to these numerous titles that are engraved on the back of their chairs is John's wife, of course, you know, who only has her name, date of life, and then wife of John S. McMillan on it, as if that's all she did ever. The greatest life. thing she ever accomplished mm-hmm. was marrying was him. Marrying a man. That, you know, we love our weird rich kings. <laughs> So there's a lot of lore surrounding the mausoleum, as you might expect. I could imagine. Because it is so weird looking, so um, fantasy-esque. And it's also like in the middle of nowhere. It is. That's the thing that's really odd about it. It's like you're going to the harbor and you have to take a detour to go there. And I just was like, sure, why not? I got my truck. I don't have a ferry visit until... A couple hours, so I'll just go and check this, like, weird spot out. In the literal middle of the woods. Well, it was, yeah, Roach Harbor was our last, one of our last site visits, so it was kind of like, okay, Mm -hmm. I heard about it, they are hyping it up in the site visit, and I was the dope that was like, I wonder what's going on over there. It turns out it's, (laughs) it's a... 
a literal Elks Club uh, Psi Beta Beta or whatever <laughs> Sigma Alpha grind set <laughs> uh, for fraternity set up there. So um, some people say that there seems to be an empty space at the table. Ooh. Um, as if there was supposed to be a chair there. Another chair. It is. <laughs> people say that this is rep- supposed to represent um, the Macmillan son who turned away from Methodism. Um, but there's literally... Smart move. There's literally no evidence I could find for this. So I also personally, having not seen it in person, only seeing it in pictures, it does not look like there's an empty space around the table. Yeah, I don't think that. I don't think so. Either. So um, I think that's a, uh, an, another example of urban legend creeping into reality. So it's possible that this son is like truly estranged, like just completely written out of history. But as far as I could tell, John's first son died shortly after being born. And then the other two are represented in the mausoleum. And as far as I could tell, there was no evidence of an estranged son. So either they're very efficient of just wiping his existence away from the records, which is possible. Yeah, rich dudes can do that. Especially in the 1800s. Oh yeah, that definitely that sounds like some rich 1800s dude kind of late, activity. Late 1800s, Hate my early son. 1900s. <laughs> uh, uh, some uh, there will be blood dad son dynamics going on there. <laughs> So, um, six years before John died, he ordered the Afterglow Vista to be built, and it was completed in 1936, which is also the year John died. And it cost about $30,000. Matt, do you want to estimate how much money that would be in today's? $30,000 in 1800s? Or no, in early 19, 1900s. 1936, $30,000 would be the equivalent. Uh, of, well, I'm going to go with $800,000. Um, you're a little high. $632,000. Okay. Yeah. So that honestly, it's really not that. It's actually pretty cheap. For um, a mausoleum. <laughs> yeah, I I will like to point out that this is basically a grave that costs more than most single family houses that's true but for a rich guy like when you go into the afterlife are you going to get outdone by a pharaoh from like five thousand years ago or are you gonna like i don't think anyone's topping the pharaohs they went out with style but also you know you have an entire society larding your tomb before you die so it's not it's not kind of fair for the for the small business owner i mean you were the one that made the comparison so. <laughs> now that i think about it it's like <laughs> meh, he did pretty good for himself the, the mr john here <laughs> so the afterglow vista was also um has been called a masonic landmark Uh oh we uh-huh. got masons inbound and the mausoleum's care is monitored by the Sigma Chi Fraternity <laughs> Monuments and Memorials Commission. You'll remember that Sigma Chi is the fraternity John has engraved in his tomb. It's very important to him. Folks, we have to protect ourselves from the Masonic threat. <laughs> um, actually, I think John was the first president of that fraternity as well. Or um, had like a very foundational role in that fraternity. Mm. So it's okay. very important. To him. Yeah. Um, so because it is Masonic in nature, it's a Masonic monument. There's a lot of symbolism in symbolism. this. Symbolism. As you might imagine. <laughs> um, it's a little weird. So an informational plaque at the site reads... The structure is approached by two sets of stairs representing the steps within the Masonic order. The stairs on the east side of the mausoleum stand for the spiritual life of man. Oh, okay. The winding in the past symbolizes that the future cannot be seen. The stairs were built in sets of three, five, and seven. 
This represents the three stages of life, youth, manhood, age. That's an interesting uh, theory on the, the, the steps of life, but okay, I'll, keep, I'll let you keep going. The five orders of architecture, Tuscan, Doric, Iconic, Corinthian, and Composite. It's interesting that they're only talking about Greek, but keep going. <laughs> uh, the five senses and the seven liberal arts and sciences, which is, of course, grammar, rhetoric, logic arithmetic geometry music and astronomy they did not de include defense against the dark arts they also didn't include <laughs> physics yeah that's a i mean that's gr that's greeks for you um the columns <laughs> were created to be the same size as those in king solomon's temple whoa <laughs> i don't really know how they got the specs on they must that, have gotten but... it from the the bible <laughs> um I don't it's kind of crazy that that's just like oh yeah we also built your tomb like the king of israel <laughs> like I what mean... Dude, I I don't think that's still standing. No, yeah. um, no one. I don't even think anyone knows what that is. Like, where is it? Like, Maybe it is described in the Bible. Yeah, I, that's still kind of janky to me. Those some of those metrics don't hold up. Um, and, just saying, <laughs> they don't go and convert over to meters. If you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and then the broken column that I mentioned earlier. It represents. The broken column of life. That oh, man okay. dies before his work is completed. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's true, though. I mean, you get, I never thought I was going to say this, but you do have to hand it to the Masons on this one. They, they, that's a good metaphor. <laughs> the center of the mausoleum <laughs> boasts the round table of limestone and concrete surrounded by six stone and concrete chairs the chairs bases are crypts for the ashes of the family while the whole represents their reunion after death so that imagine was... being a guy who got the order for this thing oh i bet he loved it oh he, he was he was tough. over the roof especially in like western washington where no one orders stuff like this and he was a mason, <laughs> yeah. obviously. Yeah, he so was he like was going real. ham. He was just like, mm, pyramids, uh, King Solomon. Uh. <laughs> he loved it. And Classics. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a little bit more about John, and maybe you'll understand why he um, was so into the symbolism and the idea of building a, a mausoleum. <laughs> It's like it's like history. It it rhymes <laughs> in the words of a certain other genius, George. <laughs> About John. All right. So he was born in Indiana in 1855. Oh, sorry. <laughs> John Stafford McMillan was a lawyer, businessman, okay. and right. political figure. Okay. He attended DePauw University, which is where he became a member of Sigma Chi. Um, okay. And as I mentioned before, he did serve as the fraternity's first grand consul, which is an international president. So a little bit more fancy than I initially gave him credit for. Yeah. <laughs> Very elegant. So he moved to the Washington Territory. Oh. Back yeah. when it was still a territory. Heads up on this podcast, before you continue, when we start these topics, we're often going to say they headed or settled or went to either when it was the Oregon Territory or the Washington Territory. Or the Columbia Territory. Or the Columbia Territory. It's actually more accurate, yeah. probably, to say Columbia but, Territory. Yeah, 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 you're totally right. It, anyway. But... <laughs> When we say that, we're going to, at least I'm going to always groan because it'll be like, we're going to have some weirdo coming. It's yeah. always never just a normal guy. It's like a guy who's going to bring his weird fraternity cult to San Juan Islands. <laughs> so, uh, 
him and his wife and his first son first came to Washington in 1884, where he became the owner of the Tacoma and Roche Harbor Lime Company, which was the largest lime company west of the Mississippi. He mixed the so lime a, and the cocoa. He's a big deal. <laughs> Wrong Macmill- lime. <laughs> um, as I said before, Macmillan's family consisted of his wife, whose name is Luella. Ooh. His son's John, um, the one who died as an infant. Okay. And then Fred and Paul. And he also had a daughter named Dorothy, who died oh. as recently as 1980. Whoa. Yeah. We got so some old timers. Modern history here. These are These people were here for Reagan. I mean, when you really think about it, he first moved in 1884, which is only, well, now, like 140 years ago or something. Right. Yeah. So not that long ago, really. I know. A lot of this stuff is more recent than we like to admit. Um, Obviously, he was a Freemason, (laughs) and he also founded the Roche Harbor Yacht Club. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we love, we love, we have nothing but love for the Roche Harbor Yacht Club. Um, I bet that the Roche Harbor Yacht Club goes hard. Oh, yeah. And that they yeah. have some great parties. Um, uh, John was also super involved in t- politics, which was probably why he r- really needed to identify himself as a Republican in death, which and I that, said was embarrassing. Well, <laughs> and, you know, it, back then it was like the Republican Party was like the that party the good party I, yeah but, but listen, it was like he was still alive until it being a weird like business only cult i'm just saying that <laughs> i would not like to be identified by my politics right. in death I, I i mean if you won the civil war yeah you would you would want to stun on I, them a maybe. little bit being a republican in like 1860 was kind of like being a bolshevik in 1917 like it was just like you done all of this crazy stuff and no one would ever believe that you could get it done and then you like have like 12 presidents that suck and everyone goes wow why did we elect republicans in the first place so yeah i guess you're right you probably live long enough to see yourself become the villain in that story (laughs) in his case he definitely did um, well, John was deep into being a Republican because he was buds with Teddy Roosevelt. The Teddy Roosevelt. And he apparently gave him tour of the San Juan Islands. That sounds about right. I think Washington was um, one of the states that gave their electoral, um, one of their electors during the 19, I want to say 12 election to Teddy Roosevelt. And it was like something that killed his uh his uh his uh predecessor taft like it's it destroyed his election like woodrow wilson won his election with a plurality of the vote like like 41 percent of the vote because teddy roosevelt took like all of the votes that um uh, taft needed to win so this totally tracks with that same time period of like hey we got the progressive teddy roosevelt here in washington state I mean, in this case, state, so. Um, John also was personally involved in politics beyond his um, love affair with Roosevelt. Mm. Um, He ran for U.S. Senate in 1895 and served as, I don't think he won, Uh, He served as a member of the Washington State Railroad Commission, which is very powerful. Bad guys, too. They were really rotten. (laughs) And he was also a delegate to the Republican National Convention um, from Washington Mm -hmm. in 1924 and 1932. Ooh, he was still with the party during the Great Depression. Babe, I told you. (laughs) Yikes. I don't think he was with the party in 1860. I think he was like 1900 onward. Way to pick a loser. <laughs> he also built the Hotel de Haro, a 20 mm-hmm. room hotel, in 1886, which is around the original Hudson Bay Fost. The hotel has one foot thick log walls that can still be seen by special requests they've renovated since the originals 
But you can still see the, some of the original logs if you ask very nicely. Mm. And by 1890, the company town, which was McMillan's company town. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's the, yeah. we ha- we're hitting all the bingo cards for Washington starting up. Is company town Republican? Yeah, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt Railroad. We're just going down. We're going down the list. <laughs> right by the end of it, collect your prize because we're going to go through all the points. I'm hearing already. <laughs> And by 1890, the company town had grown up around the hotel. Um, So at the time, Roche Harbor consisted entirely of a modern lime factory, Mm. a barrel works, a warehouse, the docks, ships, and piers, offices, a company store. Mm -hmm. Love those company stores. Gotta get that script. A church, a school, barns, and homes. Got to have the place where they to, for my workers to live. You, I got to take care of my workers. It, I'm doing so much for them. And as you can imagine, Roche Harbor um, has grown significantly by then and now boasts a whopping 651 people. Yeah, we all know that company towns are extremely successful over the long time. Because, you know, centering your entire life around work always works out great (laughs) no business ever goes out of business no um (laughs) and of course nobody ever lived in roche harbor before and certainly not you know the thriving coast salish communities of willicook I don't know um, what you're talking about. That extended from Roche Harbor to Lonesome Cove and had like 10 long, large long houses. But they didn't, nobody was there. It was no. empty. Yeah. The so. land was empty for them to put it all there. I would just like to say as a side note, Roche Harbor is a small town now, but having 10 large long houses in this like small amount of area, which means it was a huge indigenous community community. yeah it's probably it was probably comparable to the amount of people who moved there uh if it was rotated in and out of uh with traders and stuff like that so it's interesting that they are like we built this new civilization in reality they kind of just replicated what was there but with a worse outcome (laughs) like all the same things but worse (laughs) So I've told you about this mausoleum and the family that's buried there. And you, we, might we think, you might think that's the end of the story. I um, thought. So you like, like, yeah, there's six people, but let me tell you about a secret seventh person. Uh-oh, the secret seventh will reveal themselves. So now we're going to answer the question of who is Ed- Ada Benet. Oh, boy. So Ada Benet, this wonderful woman, I I I am gonna get very angry on Ada's behalf. I'm just warning you now. Ada was the caretaker of the Macmillan children and John's secretary. Um, mm-hmm. I want to say up front, she was a white woman. Mm. I, that was one of the first things I checked. I was like, are we sure? That- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that- back then, you yeah. you never know. <laughs> Um, so why was she buried there, right? Like, I was, these are the questions. I was like, why would she be buried there? Eyebrow raised, buried there. Um, (laughs) is she a slave? Are they part of the polycule? (laughs) All valid questions. But no. What really happened is in the 1950s, the Tart family bought Roche Harbor Resort and came across an urn. They later learned that this urn contained the ashes of a woman named Ada Benet, um, a, fam- a staff member of the McMillan household. The new owners then took it upon themselves to entomb Ada's ashes in the mausoleum, Oof. though there wasn't a seat at the table. Oof. Remember, there's only six. So um, they said, well, she wouldn't even have sat with them in real life because she's their servant. So they just picked like a random spot in this mausoleum to bury her and it's unmarked. 
And they just buried it. Like, she wasn't even supposed to be there. She had a family. She at least a sister. Like, I looked it up. She had, at least had a sister in the area. And it's insane that, may I remind you, when the youngest Dorothy died? Um, 1980. Mm-hmm. Which means that she was still around. And they could have just found her. Even in death, Republicans don't respect it's, labor. It's di- well, it's disrespectful in two ways, right? Because it's disrespectful to Ada Benet. Um, and it's also disrespectful to the Macmillans because, like, did the Macmillans approve this? Right. right. Um, did uh, Dorothy bless this? Was she like, yeah, that's what they... As far as I can tell, nobody was contacted about this this is when um people were called in uh they were just calling an audible and they did not consult anyone they're just like they were just like oh we're gonna just put these ashes (laughs) somewhere unmarked in this mausoleum (laughs) it's gonna turn out great i'm sure (laughs) there's nothing ever wrong about misplacing bodies that will never ever cause any problems. There's going to be no repercussions at all for <laughs> there's this. No, there's no issues here. Everything's normal. <laughs> um, so, Matthew, I got to then ask you this question. Do yeah. you believe in ghosts? No. Well, Ada does, because <laughs> apparently she's also... I mean, she has the ability to be a ghost in my with my permission after that story. <laughs> uh, yeah, because apparently she's also very pissed off about this, because apparently she haunts the Hotel de Haro and the Mausoleum at night. Um, so an employees at the hotel have reported a storeroom door that opens on its own, appliances turning on and off, and items in a storeroom shifting from time to time, and the sound of rustling clothing when no one was there. So even in death, she says, workers of the world unite. (laughs) She said, I'm in the kitchen. We are in the kitchen whipping it up. (laughs) One woman's hands reportedly went numb when she went into... When she went to enter the lobby because the hotel is so haunted, she couldn't go in. So this was a woman who was going to stay Mm -hmm. at the hotel. Mm -hmm. She goes to enter the hotel lobby. Her hands go numb and she says she can't stay there because it's so haunted. Mm, Sure. Um, And usually, unusually, I will... It wasn't until Ada's ashes were placed here in the mausoleum in the 1950s that people started reporting unusual and ghosting happenings. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely Ada just like pissed off that she it's was that, placed somewhere where she shouldn't be long. It's that moment in Poltergeist when um, the dad screams, you just removed the headstones. <laughs> <laughs> but for for the maid or the secretary of this but family. It's, but it's different because we're purposely... <laughs> yeah, they did it on purpose. It, yes, <laughs> we're taking a person and planting them. <laughs> yeah, instead of just letting them rest wherever they were, they're like, let me just bind these spirits eternally in servitude i also yeah that's the other thing it's like i can't imagine the logic where it's like oh she really loved this family that she worked for let her be a servant for the rest of her afterlife right it's it's yeah it i mean if you've ever been to the south there is a um a tradition of plantations bearing slaves on the plantation lots like in the back lots and at least they have the dignity of being separate from their masters in death even though they're still on the plantation they were like let's just put her next to them forever <laughs> i would also haunt you yeah i i get like i said i give her full permission to, to initiate the haunt <laughs> so according to the ghost stories blue lights have been spotted and photographed hovering over the chairs at the table uh-oh call zach baggins <laughs> hit him up <laughs> Uh, he'll plant some dirty mattresses and claim they're <laughs> the originals that people died on or something. This 
mattress is the same one John slept on the last last day of his life. <laughs> like, whoa. Watch Zach Baggins find this and sue us. Oh, man. Please. I need the publicity. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, he would do any of the things we just said. That was a joke. Parody. <laughs> <laughs> People claim to also hear voices in the middle of the rotunda when mm. no one else is around. I don't like that. Um, so this is an open... I never heard any voices. Well, how long were you there? Like a couple minutes. Were you alone? No. Well, there you go. There was a lot of people there, actually. It you should have nice gone time. at night alone. Oh, why would I do that? For the vibes. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Also, I don't like going to... I don't want to be out in San Juan Island all by myself at night. Like, regardless of where I'm going. <laughs> that's a whole other story, though. <laughs> so this is an open-air mausoleum. Mm-hmm. But on rainy days, it seems as if no rain falls on you. When you stand underneath what would have been a bronze roof. So apparently they originally planned to make this like a bronze roof, but it was too expensive and too time consuming. Oh, that this so is, they that's where the price came open in. Air, supposedly. <laughs> I significantly have doubts about that. I think that it was meant to be open air. And I also think that the rain doesn't feel like it's falling on you because there's trees over yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's very covered. Like, if you've ever been in the Washington right. rainforest, the rain doesn't really get through like you think it would. Right. It, that Those trees really do provide cover for a <laughs> lot of the moisture that you would get if you were just in an open field. But I do think that it's cool to think that this particular mausoleum was like magical. Like they cast some kind of spell to block rainwater or something like that. Even though, probably not. It's just probably... Yeah, it's just residual magic to right. keep people nice and cozy. Yeah, please be at my weird chair mausoleum well, pillars. Uh, <laughs> apparently the ghosts don't want you to sit in one of their chairs um, because those who do claim to experience an uneasy feeling as if they are trespassing. And some even claim to feel hands on them, Lay hands pushing on. them off the chairs. Yeah. Lay hands on. Let's go. And according to legend, it is said as the sun sets on the mausoleum, shadows begin to appear around the table. And um, some people think that it's the Macmillan family, meaning once again. Even in hell, they're doing business deals because the business. They're Methodists. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, some people would take great issue with the idea. The, the grind never stops, even when I'm dead. <laughs> so they don't only come out on sunset. Apparently in a full moon, you can also see ghostly people oh, so sitting werewolves. around the table. They're like um, werewolves, too. Yeah. Um, another thing about Ada Bene... Right, oh. and why she might be haunting them. <laughs> Haunt their asses. <laughs> Apparently, there was a restaurant um, which was built on her house. And oh, they converted, my god! They converted her dining room into a restaurant, <gasps> no. and it's apparently it's, like, stupid haunted. Um, another <laughs> yes. very haunted location is the second floor of the hotel, which is haunted by a middle-aged woman in a long dress who... If you were to ask me, would be Ada. A long, cool woman in a black dress. Five foot, beautiful nine. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you something so... This is this is all making me mad, just like from like a passive like observer. So hit me with another fact. It sucks. It's a really bad thing that they did. <laughs> yeah, it's wicked disrespectful but, to like... It's not a good thing. <laughs> pull a, a slang from my Massachusetts brethren. It's oh, like wicked yeah. disrespectful. <laughs> Boston. <Right? laughs> but to really like nail a coffin in this Ada Bene thing, um, I have oh, to give you no. some background. So her name is Ada Bene, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but to some people, it's spelled differently because there's like anglicizing mm-hmm. pronunciations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to send you this 
cocktail recipe. Oh boy, is this this is, has to do with the beginning topic? Huh? I have to send you this, and I have to have you read the um, the lore that this person has just like decided <laughs> to just put on poor Ada. Um, and this cocktail is called <laughs> the Mistress Ada Bean Cocktail. Oof. Yeah. So some people spell her name B-E-A-N-E, which I assume is the correct way. So, oh, boy. And you know it's pronounced Benet because the other way to spell it is like B E A N E Y, mm. right? So Ada Bean is just like... Mm-hmm. Not there. It's not. Um, it's not all there. Yeah, and I'm gonna send you this link, Matthew. Yeah, hit. Let's see. Let's see what we got. And I'm here. gonna just have you read about this lore. Oh boy, here we go. Of the mistress Ada Bean. Uh, I don't like how that's named. I already feel disrespected on behalf of Miss Ada. All right. <clears throat> Where do I start? Just from the top? Mm-hmm. All right. All right. All right, folks. Here it comes. The Mistress Ada Bean. Bean. During the decades of the Roche Harbor Lime and Cement history, between 1886 and 1944, John S. McMillan had a robust business with two fine sons eager to take over when their controlling father was ready to retire. Fred, McMillan's oldest son and heir apparent, was well liked in the tiny mining town. That was his father's mining town. May I just (laughs) remind you that it's his... I also think that that's a great, like, that is like a great distillation of kind of like Washington mindset. It's like, oh, he was liked in the town. The town that his dad was the boss of everyone. That was signing his paychecks and that <laughs> like, he was like yeah, the like, heir apparent. No too. shit, Sherlock. Everyone loves the guy who's going to be your boss one day. It's so stupid. What I also <laughs> love about this is you can like clearly see that this man is really trying to flex his like novel storytelling muscles and like <laughs> really trying to put some credence into this this is not the first in the last this will not be the first nor the last san juan island writer we consult in the time during this podcast mm-hmm. this is one of many people flexing their <laughs> literary <laughs> muscles and, so um so we already have I guess this wouldn't be an accuracy, but as we're reading, I want to yeah, just go ahead. have people keep in mind some of the inaccuracies that we hear. So. I'm glad you stopped just to emphasize, like, he was well-liked in town. It's yeah. like, yeah, no shit. All right. And I, oh, yeah. Oh, that's not good. Um, McMillan's bookkeeper was Ada Bean, a woman in her early 30s that kept to herself most of the time and was considered by the town folk to be a spinster. Do we explain what a spinster is for the young uh, TikTokers? Or do Um, you think they know? I mean, I feel like it's in the lexicon enough, but it's like an unmarried woman who can't get a man. Yeah, it was pretty messed up back then, how we talked about women who couldn't get married. I literally can't. Okay, hit hit me with some more facts. I just can't get over it because he says it's his bookkeeper. Yeah. She Mm. wasn't. Yeah, that's true. Like their nanny, Nanny, essentially, and like their housekeeper. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, or like, you know, permanent staff mm-hmm. maid, maybe. I don't know. Domestic. When, yeah, domestic worker. Employee. Yeah. yeah. She lived with him. Yeah, Very that's close already to the wrong. Family. And then right? I'm, I'm thinking her age is probably not completely accurate at this point. In, oh, honey. Um, because she raised Fred, I'm guessing. Oh, yes. Let me show you. <laughs> it's like a misrepresentation of her, like, person before even getting to the to the juice i we're already like pulling this thing apart and also i have to emphasize that the um the page is north northwestyachting.com that we're reading this from 
I will locate a picture of Ada Benet for Oh, you. yeah. Just look it up while, while I keep reading. Okay. Um, it was not uncommon to see her working late into the night in the tiny office located in the top floor. In the top floor? On the top floor of the McMillan estate. estate. Now, the resort's executive room. One of these late nights, angry voices could be heard coming from the office balcony, and the townspeople could make out the voice of a man. The next morning, Ada was found dead by one of the house servants. She had hanged herself from the chandelier. The company physician, Doc Capron, was urgently called to the office by McMillan upon, and upon an examination, the shocking discovery of her hidden pregnancy was revealed. I'm, I'm feeling that's not true. That none of this is true. So I'm going to show you this picture, Matt, and I <laughs> want you to keep in mind, right, mm-hmm. that this is a 30-something bookkeeper who became pregnant with Fred McMillan's a bastard, real hotsy totsy bastard child and then killed herself <laughs> at the have, age of mid 30 something. I like, can't have no bastard child. Max, it ruined me, man. <laughs> so this woman that I'm about to show you is like Max 35 years old. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Oh wow. That's that- a does that seem like an accurate picture to you? That's of, uh... an old woman. <laughs> That's a real old woman. And I, yeah, I I was already having difficulty believing that because if Fred McMillan was raised by her, she had to be at least in her teens when he was born. And then by the time he was an adult, he would have been, she would have been like past his, like that age anyway. I'm saying ma- at minimum yeah. in her like early teens, but a lot of time people got hired into their 20s. So um, this is a picture of Ada. She's so old. <laughs> she was 85. At that time when, when that photo this photo was taken? was taken in 1953. Whoa. So. Yeah, um, and Fred is a man. <laughs> like. What? He would be, she yeah. would be like 40 or 50 years old by that point. Um, I won't make you read the rest of the story because it's so... It's so great. This is so, so silly. In, it's so insane and like clearly I, I made I do up. have to. I do. I really do have to. I think I do have to read one or two more paragraphs. Let me read. Okay. McMillan... <laughs> <laughs> You're soon after her soon burial. Soon after her, bur- her burial, uh, uh, a sound of a baby crying was heard from McMillan's office and the go- or the rumors of a ghost that people swore was the late out of Bane. Rumors start uh, quickly, quickly spread, started quickly spreading about the identity of the angry male voice. McMillan, concerned about falling morale and loss of production, worked to staunch the rumors, but they continued until one sober morning when Fred confessed to his father that his that the voice heard that ill-fated night was his, and the fight ensued in that in the fight that ensued was over Ada's pregnancy uh, with his child. I <laughs> I love that he says a concern by falling morale and loss of production. Not like a personal friend who raised his children died. Or Or if you believe the lore lore, of the story, his bookkeeper. His bookkeeper, anything. It's just like, ignore the dead woman, please, and get back to work. Our profits are falling by 20%. (laughs) Ever since Ada killed herself, we lost 3% on our production quota. (laughs) Our productivity has tanked. (laughs) You gotta go back to the office, Ada. (laughs) She's dead. (laughs) Just drag her out of the grave. Um, I'm going to skip all of this because it's not true. And then I want to read the drink. Yes, please tell us how to make the Mistress Ada Benet. This is or sorry, so... the Mistress Ada Bean. Well, none of this is the ending thing before we go into the recipe. While none of us know the real story, no shit, Sherlock. We celebrate the memory of uh, with this cocktail. And oh, if you're, we celebrate. 
celebrate the memory of her by <laughs> saying her name wrong, by getting her name wrong, by lying about her entire life. We have we've activated Michaela's trap card. <laughs> and then also naming it the mistress. Yeah, it's kind of disrespectful on like multiple levels. Where it's, it's like crazy disrespectful. It's like me naming. It's like Oh, it's like when you unintentionally name something bad and it's like another level of bad. You're it's like, like oh, Irish no. car bomb. Right. Like we do this <laughs> yeah. shit, but like we don't need to. And then also being like, <laughs> it's just crazy. And then he says, crazy. Uh, the writer says, um, with this cocktail, and if you're lucky enough to get a peek of her ghostly appearance, don't blame it on the bartender. I'm gonna blame something <laughs> on the bartender. This man, that. whoever wrote this, is just, was just trying to get into like Seattle Met with this article. I don't um, think it happened for No, him. I don't think so either. Um, it says, ingredients, two ounces, two ounces of spy hop gin distilled on San Juan Island with local botanicals. Ooh. Um, one fourth ounce yellow chartreuse, one fourth ounce triple sec, one half ounce lemon ginger syrup, and one half ounce fresh lime juice. And you, you know, mix it all together, put a brandy cherry in it, strain it into a cocktail glass, and pound it down. So, yeah. Um, extremely, extremely disrespectful. Written by by someone who clearly doesn't know anything about And we will this. name and shame. This is written by Bill Shaw. <laughs> She's doxing people on live. I, this is a... <laughs> public thing that people can look up from right, Northwest right, Yacht. Right. And it says Bill Shaw is the head chef of Roche Harbor Resort and Marina of San Juan Island. This was pretty disrespectful. Even if it was true. It's even if it was true. Disrespectful. He published this in March of 2019. Whew. Man. Even if this was true, this would be on a level of disrespectful that I th would border on tasteless. I would say borders on tasteless. It's like pretty bad because like, yeah. because this woman died like what seventy years ago. Yeah, right. Which isn't that long. No. Like she could potentially have family that's right. alive. We, didn't, we don't know that if we, she did or not. Too. That's the thing. It's yeah, like and you're just have. completely making up her life and like. Yeah, and it's, it makes me real mad. <laughs> I know it does. I'm sorry, hon. And it, I'll openly say this too. Like another thing you'll notice about stories out here in the in Washington, but also in the West, is that a lot of them aren't true, and they just get solidified as facts. So it's it's really hard to to separate the fact from fiction. Fact from fiction, beyond belief. Stop. <laughs> Not Jonathan this time. Franks. <laughs> if we could get Jonathan Franks on the pod, let's do it. <laughs> I would love to talk to him for like 50 minutes just to pick his brain about the formatting of our show and production tips. <laughs> um. So Matt, what did you think of the John S. McMillan Memorial Mausoleum? Do you think you'd visit in the future? Again, maybe. Um, I'm very frustrated. Justice for Ada. I'm going to put that out there. Let's get the hashtag going. Um, secondly, all bosses are bastards. Sorry. <laughs> even, in, even in death, they make you serve. It's just... Like, if you believe in an afterlife, this woman is bound to these people forever. Like, that's terrible. That's a fate worse than death, is, like, working for your boss when you're dead. Yeah. Um, taking care of the, the family and making she sure everyone's She doesn't okay. give a salary now. She doesn't even get salary up there. It's just on goodwill, you know? Um, yeah, it's it, that's that was a terrible story, and I wish that you'd never shared that with me. It makes <laughs> me depressed. But also, I mean, San Juan Island has so much stuff that is just, like, buried underneath the surface yeah, that I would weird, love to. It's a weird place. Yeah. Um, I would love to go to Roche Harbor and specifically, like, Hotel de Haro. And then um, just, like find whoever owns the place and like 
see if they actually have records uh-huh. and see if I can actually like find what's real about right. this. Right. Um, and what's just made up for cocktail recipes. Well, that's what I was going to say is while you do that, I'm going to go get a cocktail and see what's up. You, um, <laughs> see if I can get a Mistress Ada Bean. <laughs> we will absolutely be ordering the Mistress Ada Bean. Just, just, and this will not be a disrespect. I'm going to pour some out for her. We're going to take her to get in a to-go cup yeah. to the mausoleum <laughs> and some. feeding it through the dirt. <laughs> we are, we're going to give her a little something because, yeah, I don't think she got a fair shake. No Pour one what. out for Ada. I can't believe that. I, 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 st- I mean, I can believe anything when it comes to how people treat servants and things like that. But, like, that's just another level of, like, people who just own it and just going, yeah, okay, let's put this... Here. It's just like you don't get to do that. That's I wish fair. I could leave a negative review for Bill downvote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you uh, misappropriated the remains of an old woman. Downvote <laughs> one star. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you serve a drink, making fun of potentially the suicide of a dead woman. Downvote. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so bad. I just don't. I don't get it. Yeah, his story makes it worse. Right. The really. story actually genuinely makes the drink less desirable to drink. I, yeah. I'm kind of bothered that the fact that they're like, oh, this person died and now we make a drink named the mystery. That's like, <laughs> it's, just, it's like when you find out something that's not true and then you name the person the like statue of that person that thing and it's just like that is a lie and you also added the thing to get to disrespect so uh terrible anyway welcome to washington (laughs) we got a lot of great stuff planned um we're gonna work on more episodes uh one coming up is on ghost towns speaking of ghost um, I know that we have a couple of other topics from weird crime to urban legends to just, you know, messed up stuff that happened in Washington's history that deserve a little bit of a retelling. So that's it. Goodbye. This was Matt and Michaela. See you soon. Bye.